My name is Ted Grantham. I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. I'm also one of the co-directors of the Cannabis Research Center at UC Berkeley. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about cannabis water use in Northern California. And before I get started with this brief presentation, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-author on this work, Chris Dillis, who led much of the analysis uh, that I'll be presenting today. One of the major concerns um, over the environmental impacts of cannabis um, is how use, water use by cannabis is gonna affect uh, in-stream flows for uh, sensitive ecological resources and species that we're trying to protect like salmon and, um, and other, other sensitive species. We know from um, enforcement efforts in the past that cannabis uh, water users rely on in-stream diversions such are depicted here in this, uh, in, in this slide. Um, here we see on the left a um, illegal water diversion that's pumping water directly from a stream and this, uh, this diesel generator is perched you know, precariously above the stream bank. And in the slide to the right, we see um, a, a stream that's been, been ponded and lined with, uh, with, with plastic to create a pond for, for diverting water. And these, these types of impacts really raise concerns over, um, over how cannabis water users are um, are, are, are taking water from the environment and, and what this means for our, for our sensitive um, species and resources. We also know uh, that water storage is proliferating across uh, the landscape in cannabis growing regions. We're seeing these um, external water storage tanks and upland storage systems such as um, shown on the, on the right slide here. Um, but to date, um, our information about cannabis water use has largely been anecdotal, um, obtained through enforcement efforts and site visits. And for the first time, we're now able to answer some key questions with new data that's emerging from um, some of the state uh, permitting programs. Um, these key questions include, where do cannabis farms actually source their water? Where are they obtaining water from the environment? Um, how much water is actually being used? And um, we're really getting new insights on what the potential impacts to in-stream flows are from cannabis water use. So today I'm gonna to review the insights that we've gained on, this, um, on, these, on these really fundamental questions that uh, to this date have not, been, um, have not been easily answered owing to the historical illicit nature of this, of this crop. And these data that we rely upon are, are um, reporting, self-reporting water use data that's emerged from the uh, uh, Cannabis Water Discharge Regulatory Program in the North Coast region of California. Um, these data are from the first full cultivation season of the program. This was in the year of 2017. So this is actually before most of the new state permitting regulations uh, went into effect. Uh, the data that we were able to obtain from these reports include uh, the size of the cultivation area, the type of the cultivation, whether that's outdoor, indoor, and in, um, in hoop houses, for example. Um, we also gain information on monthly volumes of water that are either input to storage or applied directly to plants. Um, and finally, we get some information about uh, the storage types and capacity on, on site. So, um, the, the results that I'll be showing today re, uh, rely really on an analysis of about a thousand of these reports obtained for the 2017 uh, growing season. We actually obtained a lot more reports than that, but we screened them for quality and ended up with this restricted set of 901 sites, um, mostly concentrated in Humboldt, Trinity, and Mendocino County with a few records in Sonoma. So our first key question, where do cannabis farms source their water? Now, cannabis water users are largely located in these very rural remote watersheds and might be obtaining water from a variety of sources, including uh, surface water sources such as streams and springs, which may sort of vary seasonally in the amount of water available. Um, or they may rely on more perennial sources like groundwater that could be extracted either from inland wells, such as shown on the right, or from wells right along the riparian or stream corridor, such as shown on the left. Now, when we look at these reports, what the results have shown is that the vast majority of water users in the region, um, over 50%, nearly 60%, are relying on well water. And this was information that uh, 
b before this, these reports came out was not was not well understood. It was you know largely assumed that uh, these water users were um, were largely relying on on surface water sources. So let me just take a minute to walk you through this graph. Basically, what we see here is that in the gray bars, it's all of the uh, records combined, and what we see is that overall, nearly 60% of cannabis users in the region rely on report that reported to this program rely on wells. Um, Somewhere around 20, 15 to 20 percent of those users also rely on um, either surface water or, or spring water. Um, slightly lower fraction rely on rainwater catchments. Um, and a very small number of users actually rely exclusively or in part on offsite water sources. And these could include uh, municipal water deliveries um, or uh, or municipal uh, water deliveries from offsite sources or, or potentially direct tie-ins to municipal sources. So our key finding really from this initial analysis was that first, um, we observed a widespread use of subsurface water um, you know, throughout the North Coast. And, um, but we, we also noticed that, that nearly 40% overall um, of, of users do continue to rely on, on surface and spring water. And, and this is important because these types of water, uh, water uses, uh, water being taken from these sources, are subject to new uh, forbearance requirements that were established in 20, 2019. And what I mean by that is that any you know, cannabis uh, cultivator who's interested in entering the, the legal permitted market um, that relies on these um, spring or surface water sources are now required to uh, forbear or are, are prevented from taking any water during this uh, the summer dry, um, dry season. So basically, they have to provide enough storage on site to um, to collect water in the winter to meet their irrigation needs, or they need to drill um, drill a well. So I'll come back to that point a little bit a uh, little bit later, but just wanted to highlight this um, this finding here. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper um, into these uh, specific results on water sourcing, I can direct you to this, uh, this paper that was published um, in 2019 in, in California Agriculture. So the next question, how much water is actually being used um, by cannabis? There has, there has been some previous work um, trying to address this question. And uh, basically through interviews with grower associations, um, a number that was developed was this idea that, that plants are generally using about six gallons uh, per plant per day over, over the growing season. And this um, plant-based estimate of, of water use has been, um, has been applied in a few different uh, contexts. And one was the study here shown on the right where they looked at cannabis uh, farms in, in different watersheds in the North Coast region and use this plant-based estimate to generate basically a water budget to estimate total cannabis water demands in relation to uh, available stream flow. However, there are a few limitations of this approach. Uh, first, we know that uh, cannabis is grown um, in, in different ways, right? We have outdoor plants that tend to be quite, quite large, such as we see in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and we also have cannabis plants that are grown in, um, in, in these uh, hoop houses or covered areas where the plant density is much higher and the plants themselves are much smaller. And so we really can't compare the plant-based use um, of, of these two cultivation types. Second, we, we can expect that the seasonality, there's going to be a seasonality of water demand. Current, um, current uh, previous approaches, they've basically used um, the per plant, uh, plants, sorry, gallons per plant estimate and applied it to the entire, across the entire growing season from March until October. And we can expect that plant water demands are actually going to ramp up as they get bigger and as the season progresses and probably peak in the late, in the late summer. Finally, these plant-based approaches are, are limited um, in the way that we can interpret the data um, in relation to stream flow because this really assumes that um, the water that's being applied to plant is, plants are being taken, um, taken on demand from the environment rather than using uh, water storage. So a really important point here is that there's a difference between plant water demand or water use and water extraction. So in this case, water use is just the, the total amount of water applied uh, from either natural sources or, or storage directly to the plants to, to grow these plants. I um, mean, it really reflects the plant water demand in the growing season. And this has really been uh, what's been used previously to think about potential environmental impacts of cannabis water use. In contrast, water extraction is probably a more reliable way of thinking about um, environmental impacts. And this really represents the, uh, the sum of water taken from the environment 
and either directly applied to plants or diverted into, into storage. So it really reflects the, the total amount of water and the timing of water withdrawn from, from the environment. And this, this um, uh, way of thinking about water use is probably more ecological, uh, ecologically relevant um, when thinking about potential impacts to, to salmon and other sensitive species. So further analysis of this data have shown that uh, the source of water, which I've shown can vary quite substantially depending on, uh, on, on where they're located and um, the, every farm, uh, has a huge influence on the timing of water extraction. And here we just see a really um, notable example where if cannabis farms are relying on rainwater catchment, their patterns of extraction are going to be entirely in the winter wet seasons. In other words, these, these, their water, um, the timing of water use is going to be taken, uh, concentrated in November to, to April. Whereas um, we see that farms that rely primarily on groundwater or well water uh, pump primarily on, on demand. In other words, they're not pumping from the wells into storage, but rather they're taking that water from wells um, and applying it directly to to plants as they need it. And so in this case, if they're relying on wells, the demands largely reflect uh, really the plant water demand in the growing season. With uh, farmers relying on uh, both surface and spring uh, water sources, we see a more uh, steady demand across, across the growing season where we see perhaps some peak in the growing season months, but this the what, timing of withdrawals is actually much um, much more consistent, and this is really explained by the role of of storage that I that I mentioned earlier, and in particular, um, it appears that uh, growers that rely on seasonal water sources like springs and surface water sources like streams um, often use uh, storage. Um, such as like the pond shown here or uh, these um, above ground water storage tanks to augment their irrigation uh, supplies in the, uh, in the dry growing season. And so we took all these data and we developed a model to try to understand how um, the um, access to different water sources and or the presence of water storage actually affects these seasonal water extraction patterns. So let me take a minute to walk you through this slide. What it, what this shows is the, uh, the seasonal extraction profiles of different classes of water users. In the, um, the yellow-orange color, those are uh, water users that rely on perennial water sources like groundwater. Um, and as I showed earlier, this pattern of demand largely reflects um, cannabis, uh, the, 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 the plant water demand itself. And so it really tracks the growing season. Um, in contrast, the blue line here are, uh, represents cultivators that have access to um, a pond on site and are able to store large quantities of water in the wet season. And so here we basically see the exact opposite pattern where all of uh, the vast majority of water is being extracted in the winter months and very little water, relatively little water is being extracted in the growing season. And we see that other users that rely on, on seasonal sources but don't have access to large storage like a pond have that sort of steady um, uh, water use profile across, across the season. Just one note here is that these graphs are, um, represent the estimated use for the, the median farm size in the area, which is about a quarter of an acre. Um, so those, those demand volumes that you see on the y-axis are relative to um, the sort of the median farm, farm size. You also see in light gray here a line that shows um, the, the plant-based estimate of total, um, of total demand. So that's the 20, uh, basically six gallons per plant per day. And what we see is that for, um, for groundwater users, the, um, the amount of water uh, being applied to farms pretty much matches that amount in the peak of the dry season. But at the beginning of the growing season and the end of the growing season, uh, total water demand is actually, is actually much less. So this, um, this sort of plant-based approach that's been used previously is perhaps not the, um, is, is pretty reflective of peak season water demands, but may not be as a good an indicator estimate of demands uh, in the earlier late season. So coming back to this question of, of, of water storage and some of the policy implications of this work, um, as I mentioned earlier, farms that rely on 
seasonal uh, water sources, surface water sources like streams and springs, are under the, the new uh, permitting um, uh, system, are no longer able to take any water from those sources between April in October. In other words, they either have to um, store the water they need in the wet season or drill, drill wells. And um, based on our analysis of these data, we see that those farms that rely on these seasonal uh, water sources, um, most of them, or the, the majority of them, do not have sufficient storage to meet that requirement. And so this suggests to me that in the future, we can either expect to see increasing um, well drilling to, um, to allow them to both to, to continue to meet their water demands um, and, um, and meet the permitting requirements, or potentially the expansion of, of water storage if, um, if they're able to on their, on their site. So some key findings from our analysis of water use. Uh, first, farms with perennial water sources, in other words, farms that rely primarily on uh, groundwater or riparian well water, um, do not store much water. Um, and the extraction patterns, the timing in which water is taken from the environment, really follows plant demand during the growing season. In contrast, farms relying on seasonal water sources uh, really show a steady demand across the year. Um, and this sort of um, lack of variation really reflects sort of continued inputs of water from the environment into storage in the winter season, and then um, continued uh, uh, applications during the growing season. And finally, from this analysis, we found that farms with ponds um, generally extract you know, most of their water, if not all of their water, in the growing season and have enough water stored really to meet their plant water demands throughout the, the, the dry season. So it's the farms with the ponds that are, it's gonna be easiest for them to meet some of these um, new permitting requirements. So let's just review our key questions and um, the conclusions drawn from this analysis. First question, where do cannabis farms source their water? Our key takeaway point here is that wells are the most common water source um, in this region, followed by surface water and springs. Um, how much water you use is really the wrong question to ask. What we should be asking is how much water is extracted and when? And this, we basically find that the timing and amount of water extracted for cannabis really depends on the water source that they're relying upon or water sources and available storage capacity. So what does this all mean for impacts to in-stream flows? This is an area of research that we're continuing to explore, but these findings um, provide some insight that we can, uh, we can use to think about these potential impacts. Uh, First, we see that um, for, the, for the majority of sites, our, the extraction patterns um, really track plant irrigation demands. And so um, in, in this region of California, uh, stream flows are, are naturally quite low in the growing season. And so this additional demand for agricultural water use uh, raises some concern over in-stream flow impacts. However, it's important to note that groundwater use, which I've noted is, is, is widespread, um, and off-stream storage, perhaps might moderate some of these impacts. In other words, the impacts that we might see from direct diversions are probably greater than the impacts that we, could, um, that we might see from, from uh, groundwater use. However, uh, recent studies have shown that groundwater use can actually cause both acute and chronic stream flow depletion. And so it's not like groundwater could not have an impact on, on surface flows. It's just that those impacts might be, uh, might, might be delayed or take a little more time to manifest in the system. And when thinking about stream flow impacts and our approach to quantifying stream flow impacts, we really need to think about both the quantity and timing of, of water extraction patterns, as well as the location of diversion and whether they're taking water from surface or groundwater. Um, and so um, if they're taking water from, uh, from groundwater that's directly adjacent to the stream in the riparian zone, which is, which is quite common, the impacts are probably the same effectively as if they were taking water directly from the stream. In contrast, if the water is being taken uh, far from the stream from uh, surface water sources that are, have um, sort of limited connectivity to the stream, then those impacts are likely to be delayed um, or lagged from the timing of, of diversion. So basically this points to the need for, for further research to really get a handle on how um, cannabis water uh, diversions are impacting stream flow.
And this is an active area of research that we're continuing to explore here at the Cannabis Research Center. Um, our next step is really to link some of the information that we're gaining from um, aerial imagery mapping of the distribution of cannabis farms and linking them with these types of water use models to predict total estimated um, water demands throughout the, throughout the year and trying to understand what this might mean for, for stream flow. Another important topic that I haven't uh, discussed in this, this presentation are the potential impacts of cannabis on water quality. So we know from, again, from um, enforcement actions and from uh, uh, interviews with cannabis farmers that uh, the use of, of, of pesticides and fertilizers um, and, um, and fuels for, for generators and so forth is, is, is fairly, fairly widespread and um, represents a fairly significant threat if these um, chemicals are to enter our, our waterways. And so that's another area um, of research that we will continue to explore in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you'd like to reach out and have any questions, feel free to contact me at the email below. Thank you.